Dr. Seuss Video Classics. Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss. Narrated by Billy Crystal. Sighed Maisie, a lazy bird hatching an egg. Hmm, I'm tired and I'm bored and I've kinks in my leg from sitting, just sitting here day after day. It's work, how I hate it. I'd much rather play. I'd take a vacation, fly off for a rest if I could find someone to stay on my nest. If I could find someone, I'd fly away free. Then Horton the elephant passed by her tree. Hello, called the lazy bird, smiling her best. You've nothing to do, and I do need a rest. Would you like to sit on the egg in my nest? The elephant laughed. <laughs> Why, of all silly things, I haven't feathers and I haven't wings. Me on your egg? Why, that doesn't make sense. Your egg is so small, ma'am, and I'm so immense. Tut, tut, answered Maisie. I know you're not small, but I'm sure you can do it. No trouble at all. Just sit on it softly. You are gentle and kind. Come, be a good fella. I know you won't mind. I can't, said the elephant. Please, begged the bird. I won't be gone long, sir. I give you my word. I'll hurry right back. Why, I'll never be missed. Very well, said the elephant. Since you insist, you want a vacation. Go fly off and take it. I'll sit on your egg and I'll try not to break it. I'll stay and be faithful. I mean what I say. Toodaloo, sang out Maisie and fluttered away. Hmm. The first thing to do, murmured Horton. Let's see. First thing to do is to prop up this tree and make it much stronger. That has to be done before I get on it. <laughs> I must weigh a ton. Then carefully, tenderly, gently he crept up the trunk to the nest where the little egg slept. Then Horton the elephant smiled. Now that's that. And he sat, and he sat. And he sat, and he sat. And he sat all that day, and he kept the egg warm. And he sat all that night through a terrible storm. It poured and it lightened, it thundered, it rumbled. This isn't much fun, the poor elephant grumbled. I wish it would come back, cause I'm cold and I'm wet. I hope that that Maisie bird doesn't forget. But Maisie by this time was far beyond reach, enjoying the sunshine way off in Palm Beach. And having such fun, such a wonderful rest, decided she'd never go back to her nest. So Horton kept sitting there day after day. And soon it was autumn, the leaves blew away. And then came the winter, the snow and the sleet, and icicles hung from his trunk and his feet. But Horton kept sitting and said with a sneeze, oh, I'll stay on this egg and I won't let it freeze. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. So poor Horton sat there the whole winter through. And then came the springtime with troubles anew. His friends gathered round and they shouted with glee. Look, Horton the elephant's up in a tree. They taunted, they teased him, they yelled. How absurd! Old Horton the elephant thinks he's a boy. They laughed and they laughed. Then they all ran away. And Horton was lonely. 
he wanted to play. But he sat on the egg and continued to say, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful, 100%. No matter what happens, this egg must be tended. But poor Horton's troubles were far, far from ended. For while Horton sat there, so faithful, so kind, three hunters came sneaking up, softly behind. He heard the men's footsteps. He turned with a start. Three rifles were aiming right straight at his heart. Did he run? He did not. Horton stayed on that nest. He held his head high, and he threw out his chest. And he looked at the hunters as much as to say, Shoot if you must, but I won't run away. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful, 100%. But the men didn't shoot. Much to Horton's surprise, they dropped their three guns and they stared with wide eyes. Look, they all shouted. Can such a thing be? An elephant sitting on top of a tree. It's strange. It's amazing. It's wonderful. No, don't shoot him. We'll catch him. That's just what we'll do. Let's take him alive. Why, he's terribly funny. We'll sell him back home to a circus for money. And the first thing he knew, they had built a big wagon with ropes on the front for the pullers to drag on. They dug up his tree and they put it inside with Horton so sad that he practically cried. We're off, the men shouted, and off they all went with Horton unhappy, 100%. Up out of the jungle, up into the sky, up over the mountains 10,000 feet high. Then down, down the mountains and down to the sea went the cart with the elephant, egg nest, and tree. Then out of the wagon and onto a ship out over the ocean, and oh, what a trip! Rolling and tossing, and splashed with the spray. And Horton said day after day after day, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. But oh, am I seasick, 100%. After bobbing around for two weeks like a cork, they landed at last in the town of New York. Holy show! The men shouted, and down with a lurch went Horton the elephant, still on his perch, tied onto a board that could just scarcely hold him. Boom! Horton landed, and then the men sold him. Sold to a circus. Then week after week, they showed him to people at 10 cents a peak. They took him to Boston, to Kalamazoo, Chicago, Weehawken, and Washington, too. To Dayton, Ohio, St. Paul, Minnesota, to Wichita, Kansas, to Drake, North Dakota. And everywhere, thousands of folks flocked to see and laugh at the elephant up in a tree. Poor Horton grew sadder the farther he went. But he said as he sat in the hot, noisy tent, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful, 100%. Then one day, the circus show happened to reach a town way down south, not so far from Palm Beach. And dawdling along way up high in the sky, who, of all people, should chance to fly by? But that old good-for-nothing bird runaway Maisie, still on vacation and still just as lazy. And spying the flags in the tents just below, she sang out, What fun! Why, I'll go to the show! And she swooped from the clouds through an open tent door. Good gracious, gasped Maisie. I've seen you before. Poor Horton looked up with his face white as chalk. 
He started to speak, but before he could talk, there rang out the noisiest, ear-splitting squeaks from the egg that he'd sat on for 51 weeks. A thumping, a bumping, a wild, alive scratching. My egg! shouted Horton. My egg! Why, it's hatching! But it's mine! screamed the bird. When she heard the egg crack, the work was all done. Now she wanted it back. It's my egg, she sputtered. You stole it from me. Get off of my nest and get out of my tree. Poor Horton backed down with a sad, heavy heart. But at that very instant, the egg burst apart. And out of the pieces of red and white shell, from the egg that he'd sat on so long and so well, Horton the elephant saw something whiz. It had ears and a tail and a trunk just like his. And the people came shouting, What's all this about? They looked and they stared with their eyes popping out. Then they cheered and they cheered and they cheered more and more. They'd never seen anything like it before. My goodness, my gracious, they shouted. My word, it's something brand new. It's an elephant bird. And it should be. It should be. It should be like that. Because Horton was faithful. He sat and he sat. He meant what he said. And he said what he meant. And they sent him home happy. 100%. In the Circus by Dr. Seuss. In all the whole town, the most wonderful spot is behind Sneelock's door in the big vacant lot. It's just the right spot for my wonderful plans, said young Morris McGurk. If I clean up the cans, now a fellow like me, said young Morris McGurk, could get rid of this junk with a half hour's work. I could yank up those weeds and chop down the dead tree and haul off those old cars. There are just two or three. And then the whole place would be ready, you see. All ready to put up the tents for my circus. I think I will call it the Circus McGurkis. The Circus McGurkis. The world's greatest show on the face of the earth. Or wherever you go. The Circus McGurkis. The cream of the cream. The Circus McGurkis. The Circus Supreme. The Circus McGurkis. Colossal, stupendous. Astounding, fantastic, terrific, tremendous. I'll bring in my acrobats, jugglers, and clowns from a thousand and thirty-three faraway towns to the place that you'll see them in, ladies and gents, right behind Sneelock's door in the great McGirt tents. And I don't suppose old Mr. Sneelock will mind when he suddenly has a big circus behind. After all, Mr. Sneelock is one of my friends. He might even help out doing small odds and ends. Doing little odd jobs, he could be of some aid, such as selling balloons and the pink lemonade. I think 500 gallons will be about right. And then I'll be ready for opening night. What an opening night! What a night! What a sight! I'll hoist up the curtains. The crowds will crowd in. And my Circus McGurkis will promptly begin. With a welcoming toot on my welcoming horn by my horn tooting apes from the jungles of Jorn. Where the very best horn tooting apes are all born. Because the very fresh air there is fine for their lungs. And some of those fellows have two or three tongues. This way, step right in, 
This way, ladies and gents. My sideshow starts here, in the first of my tents. When you see what goes on, you'll say no other circus is half the great circus. The Circus McGurkis is. Here, on stage one, from the ocean of Alf, is a sight most amazing, a walrus named Rolf who can stand on one whisker, this wonderful Rolf, on top of five balls, two for tennis, three golf. It's a marvelous trick, if I say so myself. And on stage number two, here is something quite new. From a country called From comes this drum-tummied snum, who can drum any tune that you might care to hum. Doesn't hurt him a bit, cause his drum tummy's numb. And you'll now meet the Foon, the remarkable Foon, who eats sizzling hot pebbles that fall off the moon. And the reason he likes them red hot, it appears, is he greatly enjoys blowing smoke from his ears. Of course, pebbles like this are quite hard to collect, but Sneelock will manage somehow, I expect. After all, Mr. Sneelock is one of my friends, and I'm sure he'll help out doing small odds and ends. And on stage number four, see the wily Walu, who can throw his long tail as a sort of lasso. With a flip of the hip, with a tail of this kind, he can capture whoever is standing behind. He can capture old Sneelock. I'm sure he won't mind. And now here is a hoodwink, who winks in his wink hood. Without a good wink hood, a hoodwink can't wink good. And folks, let me tell you, there's only one circus with wink hooded hoodwinks, the Circus McGurkis. The show of all shows, there's no other showman who shows you a show with a blindfolded bowman. The blindfolded bowman from Brigger Barut, the world's sharpest sharpshooter. Look at him shoot! Through the holes in four donuts, two hairs on a worm, and the knees of three birds without making them squirm. And then on through a crab apple, up on the head of Sneelock, who likes to help out, as I've said. And now, come to this spot, where the spotlight is hot. And you'll see in the spotlight, a juggling jot, who can juggle some stuff you might think he could not, such as 22 question marks, which is a lot. Also 44 commas, and also one dot. That's the kind of a Circus McGurkis I've got. But that's just my sideshow. A star, a beginning. This way to the big tent, you'll find your head spinning. Why, ladies and gentlemen, youngsters and oldsters, your head will quite likely spin right off your shoulders. So hurry, step lively. Quick, ladies and gents, and get into your seat. In my tent of all tents, my parade of parades is about You'll see drum major Sneelock fling flang his baton. And my organ McGorgon McGurkis come on. With its hot steaming pipes of gold brass plated tin, snorting all sorts of snorts in a bumbling din. That is super stupendous, stupendous, stuorous. And when I play Dixie, please join in the chorus. Then a fluff muffled truffle will ride on a huffle. And next in the line, a fine flummox will shuffle. The flummox will carry a lurch in a pail. And a fibble will carry the flummox's tail. Well, on top of the flummox, three harp twanging snarp will twang mighty twangs on their three snarper harp. 
while a bolster blows bloops on a three-nozzled bluzer, a nolster blows floops on a one-nozzled noozer. And then comes a lion who's partly a trout. Then more stuff for 45 minutes, about. And then, behind them, then while everyone stares, come my to and fro marchers, who march in five layers. The fro's march on twos, and the twos march on fro's. Don't know how they do it, but that's how it goes. And now comes an act of enormous enormance. No former performers perform this performance. This stunt is too grippingly, slippingly frightening. Down from the top of my tent like greased lightning, through pots full of lots of big stickle bush trees, slides a man, what a man, on his roller skate skis. And he'll steer without fear. And you'll know at a glance that it's Sneelock, the man who takes chance after chance. And he won't even rip a small hole in his pants. And now here, in this cage, is a beast most ferocious, who's known far and wide as the spotted atrocious, who growls, howls, and yowls the most blood-curdling sound. And each tooth in his mouth weighs at least 60 pounds. And he chews up and eats with the greatest of ease. Things like carpets and sidewalks and people and trees. But the great Colonel Sneelock is just the right kind of a man who can tame him. I'm sure he won't mind. Then I'll let Sneelock off for a few minutes rest. Well, high over your heads, you will see the best best of the world's finest, fanciest, breezy trapezing, my Zuma Zoop troop from West Upper Bendizing, who never quite know, while well, they zoop and they zoom, whether which will catch what one, or who will catch whom or if who will catch which, by the what, and just where, or just when, and just how, in which part of the air. Aye, aye, what a circus, my Circus McGurkis. My workers love work. They say, work us, please work us. We'll work and we'll work up so many surprises, you'd never see half if you had 40 eyes. Again, Sneelock. Brave Sneelock is back, risking life on my patented life-risking track. While the speedsters I call my colliding collusions race round in swift cars called abrasion contusions. And Sneelock just lies there, not one bit excited. I know he won't mind. He'll be simply delighted. And here, in a contest of brute strength and muscle. Kid Sneelock, my champ of all champs, will now tussle and wrestle a beast called the Grizzly Ghastly and slap him around. Then he'll slam him down fastly and pin both his shoulders tight flat to the mat. Kid Sneelock will love it, I'm sure about that. And while that goes on there, look at this go on here. Have you heard of my herd of through horns jumping deer? Every deer jumps through horns of another pell-mell. Well, his horns are jumped through at the same time as well. By a deer whose horns also are being jumped through. By another who's having his horns jumped through too. Which I'm sure trainer Sneelock can train them to do. Then the whole tent will ring with hoorays and wild shouts when I wheel in my whales and they turn on their spouts. First my whale number one, with an aim that aims true, spouts a spout that spouts Sneelock, 
to whale number two. And then whale number two spouts his spout like a gun. And that spout spouts old Sneelock right back to whale one. And then forwards and backwards on spout after spout, my great spout rider Sneelock gets spouted about, just as long as the water they're spouting holds out. Then my tournament knights, noble apes without fears, Sir Hector, Sir Vector, Sir Box, and Sir Beers, Sir Hawkins, Sir Dawkins, Sir Jocks, and Sir Jeers clatter into the tent, and while everyone cheers, stage a roustabout joust with their boxing glove spears. And while all this wild ruckusing goes on below, at the top of the tent, look, the star of my show, great daredevil Sneelock, the world's bravest type. He comes pulled through the air by three Subrian snipe on a dingus contraption attached to his pipe. And while people below are all turning chalk white and all biting their fingernails off in their fright, Great Sneelock soars up to a terrible height. Then he shakes himself loose. He starts down in a dive, such as no man on earth could come out of alive. But he smiles as he falls, and no fear does he feel. His nerves are like iron, his muscles like steel. And he plunges down, down, with his hair still combed neat, 4,692 feet. Then he'll land in a fishbowl. He'll manage just fine. Don't ask how he'll manage. That's his job, not mine. Why, he'll be a hero. Of course he won't mind when he finds that he has a big circus behind. 